<laughs> How you doing, Joy? So Thanks stick around. Me. Yeah, stick around. We will be right back. Hi, good yeah. morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bobby, thank you so much for joining. I'm really excited to talk about your films. Um, I think your short, it's like short films that you're doing. It has such a great message from all the different areas you've been and all the different people that you've talked to. So I'm really excited to dive in and talk about some of your great projects. Thanks so much for joining today. Yeah, thanks, Joy. I've, this is the first podcast I've been in Japan, so... It's hey, Woo! happy to be your first <laughs> podcast. How exciting. <laughs> so Seeking we'll Sustainability, yeah, Seeking Sustainability Live um, is talking with experts and insiders from around Japan like you, um, people who are doing interesting things to show the diversity and uh, interest of various people and cultures and traditions around Japan. And I think your channel, Q2, is doing that mm -hmm. so beautifully. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks. I didn't even really think about it, honestly, like when I made these videos. So I'm glad that this kind of perspective is out there. You know? That's great. Yeah. How did you get started? I want to hear a bit about the backstory. Like I, I read your interview with, is mm -hmm. it a jet or the oh, yeah. journal? Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you were talking a little bit about how you got started. Mm -hmm. Um, could you give us a little introduction? How you got yeah, interested you want, like, in video? Yeah. Did you want just, just kind of like the, uh, the sound bite, like the quick and the quick story? Or did you want like the sad kind of like long story? <laughs> the quick one, if we can. Okay, yeah. Good. All right, good. So the quick story is basically uh, I was a photographer and then I moved to Okayama because I wanted to be with my girlfriend. And then um, a friend of mine here told me I should get into video. And I was like, I don't know. It seems kind of a pain. But then he's like, no, you should just like do it. Start your own YouTube channel or something just to get experience. And then and I was like, okay. So I just started with really simple like travel videos at first, and then I was really bad, um, just like cringe-worthy bad. But I, I kept the videos up on my channel because I wanted to see like my progress. And um, yeah, one thing after the next, like I just started to do more and more video and less and less photo work. And now it's my main source of income and also like my main source of passion, I guess. So yeah. That's pretty much how I started. That's awesome. So your main source of income, but it's not just YouTube, right? It's other video projects, no. is it? No, yeah, my YouTube is is, is like pitifully uh, low income. <laughs> um, but my yeah, my my freelance work is is how I make money. So, yep. And then now, and I, yeah. Um, now I'm. My goal is basically I enjoy my freelance work, but. I enjoy my YouTube stuff more, so I want to um, earn enough money through Patreon, and um, which is basically like private donations from fans, and then uh, advertisements on YouTube, so that I can just focus entirely on themes themes about Japan, not yeah. just like you know corporate videos and that kind of stuff. Like, no, I so. I love I love that flexibility that you have as a freelancer which um, mm -hmm. may be compromised once you start getting companies sponsoring you, even for videos that they're not actually directly sponsoring. They might try mm -hmm. to influence your other videos as well. So I was, I'm so glad to see that you have a very freelance heart and you are representing a lot of issues that, you know, main company people wouldn't have freedom to do. 
I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm showing your Patreon yeah. as well. So if people want to check out your Patreon page, you've got sponsorship from $1. So definitely check that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because Patreon like really doesn't recommend it. Um, they, they want like at least $3, but because they get a slice of the donation. Um, but to me, it's like I want it to be a program that anybody can be, you know, able to contribute to. And um, I don't need a lot of money or anything. I just need like a basic uh, income source um, so that I don't have to always think about like, oh, I need to take a Shinkansen to Kyoto or I need to like spend three or four nights at this place. Like I don't want to be one of those, um, those influencers who expects everybody else to pay for, for everything um where they're like oh i'm going to do an interview for you so can you pay for like all of my nights at this hotel it's like no that's not fair that's not how the economy should work um but at the same time like as far as entertainment goes like i think for the longest time artists have had patrons um to support them uh whether it be michelangelo or even like you know the modern artists so i think it's fairly reasonable to have this sort of patreon program um but i'm always willing to listen to what fans have to say uh so if if my fans say like no that's not right we want you to just do freelance work and <laughs> i'm like okay all right okay i guess that makes sense so yeah i think um funding finding funding like you say is a very important part of the process for artists going back in history yeah. forever right and yeah. finding a way to fund your work and make it more sustainable in terms of you can keep doing it is mm -hmm. is so it's so difficult to ask for money for things that you're so passionate about doing but it's such an important part of the process so it's mm -hmm. it's a really important balance to find the way to ask for funding and not compromise mm -hmm. your passion right yeah and honestly like it took a while for me to gain the confidence to um to value my work you know whether it was with freelance work or with even youtube stuff i felt like i was um, just mooching or, you know, overvaluing myself. But the, the fact is like, um, you know, people do enjoy what you create and you have a set of skills and insights that, um, are unique. Like if somebody else could do it, they would, but, um, you really have to, as an individual, I think you really have to value what, what you have to offer. So if anybody out there is wondering <laughs> or is like, you know, still new to this thing, like, don't worry, like, just, you know, stick to your guns and just like, you know, um, give yourself some value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit later about the gear that you use and the recommendations oh, yeah. sure. that you give to people who want to get started. Um, let's dive mm -hmm. into yep. some of your more popular videos, which you mentioned are also some mm -hmm. of your favorites. Um, the art mm -hmm. of katana wielding, the Iaido. Mm. That's yeah. a beautiful short film. Tell us about that one. Yeah, so that's like somehow the most popular video I have, and that's one, one of my older ones. Um, but that's a video that I made thanks to my friend John Gallione. Um, who got me into the video world. Uh, he's the one who suggested that I get the video. And so I asked, and he's like a really seasoned um, like camera operator. And so a friend of mine, uh, her name's Natsuko. Uh, she's a female um, Iaido practitioner in the video. She was like, hey, yeah, uh, all the older guys in this dojo are really friendly. They look scary, but they're really friendly. You want to interview them? And I was like, yeah, that sounds really cool. So it was just like a, a random kind of project where I was like, hey, John, do you mind helping me? And he's like, of course, yeah, sure. So a lot of like the, the, honestly, like the better shots in that video, I credit to John because he just knows how to capture motion really well. And then um, after we got all the shots and the interviews, like I just edited uh, for the first time on Final Cut Pro uh, because at that point, 
I really wasn't making much money, so I was still using the trial version of Final Cut Pro, I remember. And looking back at the video, I'm really still like cringe. It's a little cringy because Natsuko's interview is underexposed and it's way too contrasty. Um, and I think some of the some of the shots are less than what I would consider good. But I'm still proud of the video because of how many people have enjoyed it. And the people that I interviewed have also been really happy and proud of uh, the fact that like their tiny dojo has been seen by like you know over a hundred thousand um, people so there that was like a really um, a confirmation for me like it's like okay so this channel can be make you know successful and um, yeah I'm really I'm still proud of it so that's awesome um, there's some great takeaways here. I love how you uh, feature a female um, katana expert or sword. It looks like sword dancing in the video, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's so graceful and beautiful and it's not something you would normally see women doing. And in the video she talks about, maybe she feels she would have preferred to be born in the past like during mm -hmm. but of course if she was born in the past she would never be able to practice katana wielding either but that yeah. that representation of how a japanese woman is is embracing this kind of traditional male dominated kind of art is is mm -hmm. really yeah. nice to see that represented yeah uh you know natsuko's like a really you know worldly person um and I think that's the initial response is like when you hear her, you're like, oh, that's so silly because, um, you know, you wouldn't have been able to do anything as a woman in like Edo, Japan. Uh, but I think that's I think that really is just like a sign of how cynical we all really are. Um, it's it's ignoring the romantic aspect of, you know, Iaido and it's like guys just just have fun <laughs> like, can't you just like enjoy the idea that um you know there used to be a time and again i i am a very like i want to be a very forward-thinking person like i want to look forward to the future i don't think the future is all doom and gloom or anything like that i think you have fantastic things that we have you know we couldn't enjoy without scientific progress and that kind of stuff but at the same time you know like a friend of mine was telling me she's fairly young but she was telling me like in japan there used to be dozens of recognized seasons like i think it was like 70 seasons or something like that and it's really like, kind of inspiring to hear some of this poetry about like calendars and like oh this is the season of when man praying mantis eggs ha are going to hatch. And you're like, that's really interesting. But, you know, over 100 years ago, that's how predictable the weather and climate was. And that really meant something to people back in the day. Because there was no meteorologist. There was no, like, Google. It's like you had to actually be in touch with nature to understand, like, oh, no, 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 this is, like, when we go harvest because of the moon and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't think it's sappy at all. I think it's very real. It was a part of everyday life. And um, you can take it as just silly fantasy, but I think it just makes life more enjoyable to know that like this stuff exists and it's not just yeah. in books. No, absolutely. That it's it's alive and people are still appreciating it and practicing mm -hmm. it and, yeah. uh, you know, taking it seriously as a part of their modern lives. And I think in so many of your videos, you've showed that so beautifully. Uh, just one takeaway before we leave the Yado mm -hmm. video. I sure, love yeah. when he's talking about the rope and how they mm. used <laughs> to dip dip the rope in umeboshi and suck yeah. on it because they wanted the sour salty f uh as they're doing long journeys what a great yeah. story 
<laughs> yeah, Yamamoto Sensei like really has a, I mean, he can talk for hours about every piece of the sword. So, um, but yeah, that little part I thought was really neat. Um, I I would I would never do it just because like <laughs> I feel like it's so unhygienic. But you know, you build up your immune system, right? Like you were saying. Um, so it's pretty neat to listen to those stories. <laughs> It's wild. And what a beautiful photo. Uh, what a beautiful short video about this kind of uh, martial art, but so graceful and so like peaceful. It's almost like yoga mm -hmm. in the way that they practice it. Right. That was really surprising to mm -hmm. me. I love that. Yeah, I think so. Um, some of the negative comments I've had, oh, they almost always focus on the lack of violence in this martial art um and they you know it's, it's usually something along the lines of like oh like they're just silly old men like swinging swords pretending to be a samurai and it's like i i know what you're saying because a lot of people look at martial arts as a, an effective um you know form of violence like for self-defense and it's it's like guys this <laughs> We don't live in an age where we're swinging swords and killing people like this is just distilling the spirit of um, of being a bushi so like it's about self-control and elegance and really considering the value of human life um, not <laughs> senselessly like chopping people down so I think that's really interesting when I hear comments like that because how um, basically like we're uh, trained in a way from a young age to glorify like killing and violence. And don't get me wrong, it can be fun to watch an action movie, but I think we should also understand like, you know, uh, what it means to hold a piece of sharp steel. Um, what kind of responsibility that plays on you. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I loved all the the footage and it's it's not a long video. Your videos are quite short, but I think you're you're mm. able to capture so much in that short time. And I loved his stories, the sensei stories about why he continued. And it was more about mm. his personal connection to the teacher and eating <laughs> persimmons at the sensei's house. And then yeah. that that made him invested in continuing to study. It was his mm -hmm. relationship almost with the sensei. And I think that's so important in so many things. And I do tourism consulting and, and mm -hmm. talk to guides. And I'm always trying to encourage guides to make a personal connection with visitors. That it's not, it's not just about telling them their information about this place it's about connecting on a personal level and mm -hmm. so it's so nice to hear that the sensei his connection to that martial art is personal it's his personal connection to his sensei when he was learning and that's really powerful i love that yeah i was really surprised he even said that um because it's quite a personal story i don't think he said that to many people um but like you'd expect a martial art, you know, master to be something like, you know, sharing a story of, uh, oh yeah, and this is when I won the tournament, or this is when I, I beat this really strong opponent, or overcame this, you know, rival or something like that. But he didn't mention that at all. He was just like saying this really heartfelt story about eating fruit on a backyard, you know. <laughs> like I thought that was really sweet and I also really reflected like the type of people um, who were at this dojo too like they just really enjoy life and um, yeah they just want to have a good time yeah so. and you also in some of your other very popular videos you're also mm -hmm. focusing on martial arts so kids karate mm. uh, a person who learned how who did an apprenticeship after quitting his company job and learning how to wrap the sword handles and how mm -hmm. painful that is as a job but he really enjoys doing it and everything yeah that's a really interesting one yeah i mean i just really um 
I think pretty much any story can, any person's background or story can be interesting. Uh, it's just that we forget the details or we assume things um, so that the audience can never like, savor everything. But uh, in terms of martial arts, I think I've always been interested in martial arts, um, whether they be like from uh, Korea, like China, Malaysia, Japan. Like, I just think that even if, Mm, I think, <laughs> despite what I just said, I do think a controlled form of uh, violence and physical exercise can be like healthy, um, because we are animals and we have this like chaos inside of us. Uh, you can also like create the sense of camaraderie, you know, with your fellow um, martial artists. But like I said, I think it has to be controlled. I think there has to be a level of respect and um, like spirituality, even um, a sense of compassion for your fellow person. Um, it can't just be this blind rage and like you know, sadism. Um, it has to be like this. Like, you have to be conscious of like personal growth and um, your relationship with other people. And I think martial arts can really help you with that whether it be Aikido or uh, Karate or wrestling or, you know, anything. You, you sense these people really have this intimate bond with their teacher and their rivals or anybody because it's just so different than, like, sitting across from a table with a business partner. It's like you're grappling with this person. <laughs> like, uh, sometimes, like, you know, putting yourself in really dangerous situations because of the level of trust and um, courage you have. So I think that martial arts is really interesting. Um, and if I can get, like, if I can represent it in a beautiful visual format, then I'm really happy. But it's kind of difficult because you have to establish trust. Yeah, of course. And to have the introductions and be able to have those interviews with people, mm -hmm. it, yeah. it really takes a lot of trust for them. You know, they don't know you and, you know, finding yeah. that connection. Um, I yeah. love how you're, you're representing, you know, traditional Japanese culture, but you're representing it in a new way that mm -hmm. is dying out. Um, for example, mm. the guy who's wrapping this, the sword handles, he said yeah. there's only 20 of them left in Japan, is what he reckons. I mean, yeah. these, these are artisans that, you know, their trade is dying out. And it's a slice of history that you're mm -hmm. documenting at this time, which is worth remembering and thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty neat. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it makes you wonder about resources in Japan. Um, because here's the, the unfortunate part is that, like, in YouTube, <laughs> if you say you, you do YouTube in Japan, there is this image of, like, oh, you just make silly, childish videos. Um, whereas, like, I think in Europe and America, like, there's such a wide, like, breadth of topics that you can cover on YouTube that people are like, oh, what kind of videos do you make? So, like, when I introduce myself to Japanese people uh, and I say, I do YouTube videos, if they're really young, they love it. <laughs> if they're past 20, they're really like skeptical. They're like, you do YouTube videos and you want to interview me? And I was like, yes, this is what I do. And so the problem with that is that um, you have, I'm sure there are documented video clips of like artisans from all over the country um, cultures that have been like pretty much decimated and these archives are just sitting there like they're just hard to access and you know I would love to have you know connections with different networks and like artists it doesn't even have to be corporations I'm sure there are passionate people who took photos or video of like you know uh, generations of katana handle makers and um, it's just that like nobody's putting them up um and so yeah i would love to collaborate more and more with people so that we can preserve this information um yeah from both an artistic and historical standpoint definitely and now that you've got uh, a select a good 
like selection collection mm -hmm. of videos that you've done and people can yeah. refer to your page and and it gives you credibility because they yeah, can see how you're doing it and what you're doing um it's not mm -hmm. you're not a typical youtuber <laughs> let's let's yeah, talk yeah. about the calligraphy one i love the mm -hmm. big brush calligraphy one that you did yeah 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 um so koki takehara is uh it was really random actually so he he was making you know karuta do you know what that is so he was making a karuta set a card game set and he wanted an english voice to say out loud the english parts of it and so they were asking and a friend of mine at okam international center was like do you want to do it or do you does, does your girlfriend want to do it and i said yeah my girlfriend can do it and then after she recorded it for them um, we, they brought us out to dinner and I was like, wow, so you, you drew or you did all of this and the calligraphy is beautiful. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's like my full-time job. And I was like, how do you make money with calligraphy? And so we were just talking for a while and he showed me some of the stuff he's done in Hawaii and New York. And, um, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And, and I like, I just love the juxtaposition of like his character because like Koki is like he's a pretty like built guy like when you see him he's like and he's wearing sunglasses and he's like bald you know shaves his head and like he just looks kind of a formidable person but like he's so gentle like he's just kind of like he wouldn't even like you know hurt a fly <laughs> and um just talking to him like and then when you see him with this massive like calligraphy brush um, that's like bigger than a human, and you're like, this guy is just really neat and kind and open-minded. So I was able to get some really cool shots with him, and uh, yeah, it was just another world of Japanese like art that I never, I never would have known about. So. Yeah, and I uh, there's so many great takeaways from this interview that you did. And him talking, he's so, he talks mm -hmm. about, um, it's the brush that, that does the writing. I'm just holding the brush. I love that, <laughs> that quote yeah. where he's so yeah. obviously talented and it takes so much training. He's done it for 40 years, but yet he just doesn't take any of the credit. He just says, hey, it's the brush that does it. I just hold it. You know, I mm -hmm. love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Like, it's an interesting perspective because I would never say that about like my work. Like, <laughs> I mean, because I, typically, like a, a cinematographer or, or a camera operator, um, they almost never accredit the video camera for the the work. They will acknowledge that, like, oh, this lens or this this body or this sensor helped me produce like a mu even more beautiful image. But at the end of the day, it's it's the um, it's the eye of the uh, cinematographer that, that that helps create the image. Um, so it is interesting to hear, like you know, Koki's uh, view that he is the artist is just like just lifting <laughs> the the uh, the brush and letting it do its thing. And but, I love yeah. his his reasoning behind going big, right? Like, mm -hmm. why, why does he go so huge in terms of calligraphy? And he was mm -hmm. talking about sometimes your emotion just spills over the paper. So get bigger paper, bigger brushes, right? I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really neat, you know, because he, like, he's not a very, like, he's not a vain person. And so I, I think immediately, like, when you see, like, the big brush and stuff, you think, like, oh, he just wants attention or he's, like, a... Um, you know, somehow just like a very selfish, petty person. But it's like, no, he is, he's got a purpose for all of his tools. Like he has so many brushes. And I, I had no idea you could have so many brushes for calligraphy. Um, and each one has a purpose. And so, yeah, it's really neat. I'm really glad that he mentioned that. It's like, it's just to represent him. Yeah, well, it's great. And then he... His dream was to travel. So he's been to Hawaii for exhibitions. He's been to New York City, um, mm -hmm. able to share his passion for 
big brush, big paper calligraphy, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think originally he, well, he went to Paris and England. He's been to England to to visit schools and stuff. Um, so like, and his English isn't like great, honestly. <laughs> like, I, I'm really impressed that like he just really wants to get out there and share what he does and. He's quite generous, I think, too. Um, so, yeah, I wish the more people like him were around. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, because you're in Okayama and I'm mm, in yeah. Hiroshima, it's nice to mm -hmm. hear he's using Kumano brushes and, mm. uh, you know, like there's a real art area kind of collaboration going on for calligraphy, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, and, and like... I've been thinking about making a video about brushes just because like it's such a <laughs> like it's such a process to make um I saw this video about this brush company in um in, in Aichi that I was just like wow like there's so much detail um and I think you could probably automate it someday but the level of like uh, I was going to say komakai, but like detailed uh, work that's <laughs> required it is just like, wow, like, yeah, humans will have to do this for at least the next 10 years. Yeah. I saw a really great video the other day on brush making for paint brushes in mm -hmm. Europe and how it's all done by hand. And they were talking about how it's impossible to use machines because you don't get mm -hmm. the softness. And I've heard the same thing for Kumano brush and for mm -hmm. brush makers in Japan. So definitely somebody needs to make videos about the artisans who are doing mm. brush making because it, it's another dying tradition, I think, in terms of the number of people who are doing it, right? Yeah, you know, I, I hope I hope that's true. You know, I hope that like um, not everything that we do is, is replicable <laughs> by machines. Um, and I do think that like, it's like, it's a catch-22, right? Like, you know, my girlfriend uses a tablet to do digital art and stuff. And I think that's great. Like, I think it's democratizing art in a way because not everybody can afford to have, like, oil paints and, like, palettes and stuff. But at the same time, I think it is narrowing the market where only dedicated people are going to buy good brushes now. And that means that the artisans who make those brushes are going to have to find another way to live or increase their prices i mean like yeah it's a difficult time for artisans for sure yeah let's talk about your trip to okinawa i was really mm -hmm. impressed yeah. with your your okinawa video i interviewed uh, another videographer uh who runs a marketing firm called image mill uh richard okay. grian and he did a documentary about the dugong uh, mm -hmm. the dying out dugong in Okinawa and so touched on a little bit about the protests and the subversion of Okinawan culture which you touch on in this video and and do it so beautifully through interviews with local people yeah I mean, I'm glad you like it um, it was actually just a very like spontaneous video because you know my girlfriend and I, I had been to Okinawa before but it was a very just very touristy trip um kind of like a typical like you go to the beach side and like you know <laughs> like have soki soba and pineapples and stuff um which is fine i think it's really beautiful and you should enjoy yourself but um this time you know i wanted to go with both of us were like we just want to get more of a cultural experience so um the hostel that we the airbnb that we booked this couple was just like really nice. They were also very well traveled and open people. And then we just met several people that were like, I, I mean, you know, there is a stereotype that like Okinawans are like a bit more open than mainland Japanese. I don't know if it's entirely true, but I do think that if you open up to them, show some vulnerability, then they will reciprocate um so that was really cool so i we got to meet several really interesting people and then i just happened to have my you know my camera and uh, a mic 
with me. So I was like, hey, do you mind? Like, I think this could be interesting to talk about languages because I had no idea. I was just like, I just thought Okinawa Ben. So Okinawa, like, kind of dialect was the only thing. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is, yeah, it's really tragic. Um, and I wish I could do a better job <laughs> because we were only there for like four days. Um, but I'm glad I got something out of it. And then it's sort of right now kind of like a template for what I want to do in the future. Like I want to, you know, with proper gear and proper planning, you know, I really want to follow people and hear their stories and, and, you know, make sure that there's greater awareness because this stuff's happening everywhere, right? It's not just Okinawa. Um, it's going on all over the world. So I, I want there to be this, you know, kind of unified awareness of what's like, yeah, Okinawan is not, or not just Okinawa, like, uh, it could be like Amami, Amami Go or something, right? It, it could be like uh, a population of like 500 people speaking like a language, but uh, we can't always assign economic value to language or culture. Um, I think the day that we just value assign that to everything that we do, I think it's just going to be kind of sad because it'll be like, oh, well, like English and Chinese, Mandarin Chinese are <laughs> like the top languages of the world. And every other language is just second level. And you're like, uh, like. yeah. I um <laughs> I interviewed Chuck Besher in the series, yeah. and he was talking about Ainu culture and representing mm -hmm. through his film, uh, mm -hmm. representing a young Ainu woman and her journey back to her heritage of music yeah. and language and culture. And I think you've you've represented Okinawan culture, just given us a taste of yeah. what's missing in our normal understanding of a visit to Okinawa, for example. Um, mm -hmm. You talked with a professor who asked mm, his students yeah. who's read a book by an Okinawan author and none of his students had in Okinawa, right? right? right. And so he has like done a deep dive into Okinawan history and culture and through reading Okinawan books. And uh, you, you talk a little bit about how the language is lost and talk with locals who felt pressured not to show their Okinawan-ness. And we, mm -hmm. we see this story, you know, all over the world for indigenous cultures. Um, it's so important and meaningful and interesting that you represented this just on a visit to Okinawa. I, I love mm -hmm. when the guy you're talking to says, we don't say irashai in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. We say, yeah. hey, where are you going? <laughs> That's just yeah. their culture, right? That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think... So, like, I mean, I, I really just really like languages in general. Um, and I'm... I, like, I think... As a kid, I just grew up really privileged because I, I grew up with Japanese and English in my life. And I just, that was like normal. I was like, yeah. And then all my friends in Vermont, like most of them were monolingual. And then when I tried to learn Italian, that's when I really realized like, oh, this is the true value of, you know, being bilingual as, as a kid because it's no longer this like monumental task. It's just like, no, you just train and you get better. And then you get a different perspective on culture and, you know, you just immediately gain the respect of people in that area because they see that you're trying. And I think whether it's Okinawa or, you know, Hokkaido, I imagine, or any other region, if you show that you're trying to go down to, you know, another person's level or you're trying to get to their level, so to speak, I think it's just a great way to become an ambassador because it's no longer this like assumption that you're like welcomed. It's it's like no, I really want to see where you're coming from. Um, but you know, not everybody has the time or the resources to do that, and I understand that. So 
I did a great video on Japanese people and getting a DNA test, which I also okay. thought was, was really interesting. And it's another way to talk about diversity. Mm -hmm. um, can you introduce that video a little bit? Yeah, so the video, I mean, so like, yeah, I'm, I'm half Japanese, right? So my mom's Japanese and my dad is American. And uh, that's just something that's, I, I have to explain like on a weekly basis and because of Corona, but before Corona, it was like almost a daily basis because <laughs> people were always just, you know, um, yeah, just want to know. But I always thought, like, what is Japanese? Because as a kid, as a spoiled brat, I used to think like, oh, if you don't speak Japanese, then you're not Japanese. Uh, but it's like, no, because then there's like layers of, you know, you, you have to forget that stupid nationalistic mentality where you're like, um, you know, well, what if, <laughs> what if you can't speak? You know, or what if you have disabilities? You know, or what if, uh, what if you just enjoy these traditions just as much as anybody else, but you just, you know, for some reason can't speak Japanese? Who knows? Economic reasons, um, opportunities, that shouldn't qualify you <laughs> for anything. And so then I was thinking like, well, what about genetics? But then like, yeah, all over Japan, there are things like, you know, if you're from Hokkaido, if you're from Okinawa, if you're from Tokyo, like your genetic background is going to be different. And a lot of Japanese people I realize are, you know, they, they ignore the fact that they have this Korean or Chinese ancestry, <laughs> which is so interesting to me because, you know, in America, because we're such a young country, I guess, uh, I think a lot of people love the fact that they're like, oh, like I thought I was all Italian, but like, you know, I'm actually a lot of German and Irish. Um, and then, like, I think even among racists, I think, like, open racists, I think, in America, I think if they show, like, oh, yeah, I guess I'm, like, you know, part black and, like, part Hispanic, they'll be, like, I'm sure a part of them is angry, but I think another part of them is, like, just morbidly curious. And they're, like, oh, like, why? Or, like, <laughs> whereas I feel like in Japan, it's this, like, general disinterest. And it's, like... I don't want to discover anything that's potentially controversial. Let's just assume that I am a pure Japanese person. And it's like, have you ever thought about what that means? Like, and I don't think a lot of people have. Um, and so I want people to think about it and be like, listen, we have the technology now to at least to get an idea of where you come from. Um, there really isn't enough Japanese DNA samples, um, geographically speaking, uh, to get like accurate being like, oh no, no. Okay. So this is, this person's ancestry is from this region of South Korea, that kind of stuff. I think that's going to come in the next 10 years or so, but I do want this idea to like spread that like, no, like, <laughs> like you can look completely Japanese, you know, according to like what the media says and you could not speak a word of it because you were raised in a different country. And then you could look totally, let's say, like, I don't know, white, blue-eyed, but you were raised in Japan, born and raised here, and you speak and act like anybody else off the street, but you look different, so you're never going to be considered Japanese. And that kind of stuff, I think, is pretty unique to, like, um, you know, Korea, Japan, like China, those kind of regions. And I just want more people to think about it. Absolutely. It's such an important conversation that just doesn't seem to happen enough. And the three people that you are your friends, which were mm -hmm. the main people in the video, um, they're yeah. so honest and open about their experiences and how they grew up, people telling them they didn't look Japanese. And I, I think you know, on, on some parts, there's a positive on other parts, there's a negative, but mm -hmm. there's, there is a real undertone of this in Japan with so many people, how you're yeah. an outsider. And for me, you know, living in Japan more than half my life, but obviously not a Japanese person of heredity. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I will always be considered an outsider, but my kids, 
born and raised, not having any Japanese blood, but speaking fluent Japanese, it's like you say, they will always be considered an outsider just by looks. But mm -hmm. hopefully, as more people understand about diversity within Japan, thanks to you and many, many people showing um, diversity, that it'll get easier for people who look different or act different in some way. Yeah, I think so. Um, like, hopefully. It's one of those things, like, I think in the U.S. they have, I think the U.S. Census did this study where uh, basically on average, like 90% of um, refugee families within one generation, so like by the time that they have kids and they grow up, uh, they're fully assimilated, like linguistically, like, you know, educationally. Um, so that's, I think, a pretty powerful, like, statistic because a lot of Japanese people are afraid that, like, oh, if there's too many Vietnamese or Chinese or, like, you know, uh, other people that come to Japan, they're just going to dilute our traditions and, and lang language. And it's like, <laughs> guys, if they're raised in Japan and you take care of them, like if you put them through school and help them get jobs, they're going to be Japanese. Like, you, it's just, they're not going to like hide themselves into these, um, these Vietnamese like communities and never get out unless you do that on purpose, unless you purposely um, kind of excommunicate them from like Japanese society and don't give them the proper health care and education and support that they need. Yeah, then they're not going to assimilate. But I just think that this there is this nationalist uh, or maybe even like this xenophobic mentality that still persists in Japan. So I, I do think that it'll change a little bit. But I still think that, like, there's so much prejudice against, like, Southeast Asians in Japan um, that we're going to have to get more and more people in the spotlight from different uh, backgrounds to be like, yeah, no, like, give them a chance. They're going to support Japan's future. Um, yeah, definitely. They're part. They're part of Japan right now. They're living here. They're invested. Yeah. They have businesses here. <laughs> They're raising their kids here. You know, mm -hmm. let's let's accept them and accept them as part of Japan, as Japan is right now. And I think you've you've highlighted um, like Peruvian restaurant owners, uh, mm -hmm. different races of people who are invested residents of Japan in your videos as well. You've you've done a great job at at showing diversity within. Japanese people, but also within the international resident community. And that's mm. really important as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I don't want, uh, like, I don't want my channel to be like too political or anything like that. I just, or too, uh, I want to say like clickbaity. You know, uh, I do respect people who make videos about very prominent topics in Japan, um, but at the same time, like. I think it's important to be like genuine about this stuff to be like they happen to be foreign and they live and enjoy things here and if it's like oh because of their peruvian background they they provide this unique perspective or culture i think that makes sense as a video uh so i want to keep doing that kind of stuff like i don't want it to be like you know uh look at this look at this peruvian guy like you know <laughs> like he's different like, I don't want those kind of videos, so I want to be, like, something enriching, if possible. No, I think you've got a great balance. You've got uh, traditional cultures, which are worth focusing on because they're dying out or becoming less known, right? Mm -hmm. Like kimono mm -hmm. culture, um, martial arts, you know. But then you're also focusing on our reality right here, right now in Japan, and how it is becoming more international and people are invested who don't look Japanese, maybe don't speak Japanese, but they're invested in Japan. And this might be a different future we should think about and embrace, right? Yeah, I think so. And like, you know, when, I, when I've interviewed Clementine, um, and that was, you know, so actually, I, got, well, I just want to go a tangent, a little bit of tangent. Uh, my least favorite part about video production is actually like producing. So I, I do not like um, 
sending emails out or finding new people because I just, yeah, you're, you're facing rejection a lot and you have to start from zero with a lot of people. Um, but my girlfriend was like, oh, I follow this person on Instagram. Like she creates this really beautiful, like Obi, um, uh, bags and accessories from Obi. And, uh, she's like, you should go see her. And I was like, hmm. Okay, well, so I sent her a message, <laughs> Clementine, you know, she's really genuine and really friendly, so uh, she got right back to me, and I was like, okay, all right, sounds cool, um, she sounds passionate, so we figured out a date to meet, and that was really great, because, like, you know, she is an artist, so she also understands, like, you know, the different perspectives of creators, and so we were able to create, like, a I'm happy with the video that we made, um, even with the restrictions of COVID and stuff. Um, and some of her viewpoints, too, really struck home with me because, you know, it's like she had an interest in Asia in general, but she just wants to go where she can create things that she wants to. It could be Korea. It could be, like, France. It could be Japan. But Japan has all the material that she wants to use and she likes living here and I think that kind of freedom is like exactly what a lot of people want where it's like who cares about borders per se you know Clementine's Japanese as far as I know it's not great yet you know but she's working on it and she has a better understanding of kimono than most Japanese people and so I think that would be that was pretty inspiring because I was just like, yeah, I, I'm biased, right? I'm I'm part Japanese and I speak a language and I have family here, so I'm not afraid of living here. But um, for somebody to just be like, yeah, no, I'll live here as long as I can because I can do what I want. It's like, yeah, that's great. Like I hope more people in their 20s or even early 30s, 40s can like discover something that they really enjoy in a country that might not be their you know their own and make it their own so yeah absolutely and your beautiful video with clementine is how i found you because clementine mm. has has been in my series a couple times and we did a project together to develop mm -hmm. a masklet a bracelet um mask combination and yeah. she has such beautiful work upcycling traditional kimono, which has mm -hmm. been disused or discarded or just not being used and use it in new modern ways. And her attitude to living here, like you said, is, is so unique and wonderful, even though she doesn't speak the language fluently. And I would add myself to that category. <laughs> even after 27 years, I'm still struggling day-to-day -day mm -hmm. conversations okay but try to yeah. express like more complicated ideas ah, mm -hmm. so hard <laughs> it can be yeah definitely yeah, yeah. now i want to talk so. we only have about seven more minutes i'd love to talk about your future projects because you've mentioned sure. a few times on some very long-term projects that you have mm -hmm. and one um i heard you mention is about leprosy leprosy colonies mm. around japan are you still working on that yes it's on hiatus though because so i was i, I met so all right basically japan has like this like kind of really dark history with like these um islands these they call them leprosariums um where they just would just you know drag people the children or adults who were suspected of having leprosy or hansen's disease um and they would just you know, trap them on these islands. And one of these islands, Nagashima, is, is in Okayama Prefecture. And um, so now it's no longer a leprosarium. It's like a kind of historical site now. Uh, but there are still residents, you know, from, like in their 80s who, um, you know, they just they didn't have anywhere else to go, right? They didn't have jobs or family or anything outside the island. Um, and they're traumatized probably like, you know, by their whole experience. So, but the president of the, the council there, um, like he is very open and he's done interviews worldwide and stuff. And so I met with him and he said, yeah, sure. You can, you can do a documentary on us. Like 
you can interview me and the vice president because we're open because of our obligations uh, as, as press, so to speak. And I said, okay, yeah, it'd be great. I'd love to cover you guys like throughout the year. Just come back to this island periodically and listen to these stories and make like a proper, you know, 60 or 90 minute documentary or something. Um, but then like COVID happened. And so, <laughs> like, we, I mean, like, you know, you don't want to potentially infect, you know, this island's population. So, um, yeah, it's been a hiatus for like 10 months now. So... It, I'm not sure how it'll go. Um, I would love to, but yeah. we'll see well, how it, it seems, goes. It seems like a very meaningful project that I hope you can continue. Um, these these are the kind of stories that you have in your other videos where the story is kind of being lost over time. Mm -hmm. um, the tradition is being lost. The people doing these traditions are being lost. Um, I love this documentary style that you have. Uh, you also did uh, like a series of sex ed videos, which I found mm, really interesting. Yeah, Can you yeah about that's that? actually, yeah, I wasn't, yeah, because sometimes I think when new, people new to the channel, they see it, they're like, what the hell? Like, you know, like, <laughs> why is this here? But I met this uh, gynecologist um, like, you know, about a year ago now, and he speaks really well. He speaks English really well, and he's very open minded. Um, so, you know, as I'm, I think especially in Japan, women expats have a difficult time finding uh, gynecologists that they're comfortable with. Um, there are just like uh, medical and cultural differences and stuff. And a lot of gynecologists are, are male here. So, I mean, and this doctor is no different, but he's just very open minded and like kind and um, knowledgeable. So a friend of mine was like, yeah, he's really great. Um, do you want to interview him? And I said, yeah, I would love to. And then we established that, like, it's more useful if we make a couple of videos about, you know, STDs, uh, like birth control, abortion, topics that maybe not many people know about in Japan. And so um, hopefully, like, we can make a separate channel just focused on sex ed because I think it's a topic that is taboo and people are uncomfortable discussing it. But these, a lot of Japanese people, like, you know, they don't learn anything from their parents because they don't want to talk to their parents about it. Schools are, you know, then kind of outdated. And then so these kids are relying on the Internet. And, like, a lot of times, like, they're relying on, like, you know, adult videos and that kind of stuff to learn. And it's like, yeah, you, <laughs> you don't want that to be the source. You want, like, doctors and science to be the the background here so yeah if we it, it would be really great to have like another whole series dedicated to this kind of stuff um but yeah it's just a question of time and maybe even funding so yeah well it's it's a great public service like you said there's a lot of kids who are on youtube all the time but they're really confused about these questions it's so much better coming from a scientist or a medical practitioner who knows all the facts right and right. who has straight talk. And I see that on the videos, you're doing it bilingually. So it mm -hmm. opens up the audience even more to kids in Japan, kids anywhere who are interested mm -hmm. in this. And, and not only about sex ed, but also about rape and consent, which is mm -hmm. really important to have that conversation. But it's so difficult for parents, for teachers, right, who find it so awkward, although they really I mean, should yeah. be talking about it. Yeah, they really should. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, and as I was <laughs> we're talking to one of my friends, she told her daughter, because she asked her, like, oh, how should I, like, kiss my boyfriend for the first time? <laughs> my friend said, okay, so you you bring him to a really dark area where nobody is around. And then, and I was just kind of like, what? Why? Like, don't tell your daughter that. Like, my God, no, you you do it somewhere where they feel safe or where they are safe. Like, do not do that. And then, she, but she's like, why? It's more exciting. And it's like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> please, please don't tell your daughter that. And like, so that, I, I mean, you know, it's a uh, teach their own. But I do think that at least there should be some sort of education, um, base education, that's free of charge, right? Yeah. 
for sure. I'd like to talk again, bring it all the way back around to traditional Japanese crafts that are kind of being lost and need to be appreciated more and your love of wagashi because I share mm -hmm. your love of wagashi and yeah. I always recommend it as a vegan. It's one of mm -hmm. the few Japanese foods that you can always eat. Um, mm -hmm. gluten-free most of the time, a bit healthier. And you've developed this beautiful relationship with wagashi makers. Can you tell us mm -hmm. about it a little bit? Yeah, I just happened, I was just uh, a friend of mine here is, who focuses on architecture. She wanted me to take pictures of this old area of town. Um, and so we visited a bunch of shops and asked if it's okay to document some photos. And then the shop owner was, so, was just, her name is Kaji-san. She's just so like friendly and like cute and uh, she's like you can go out back if you want and you're like really <laughs> and this is a couple of years ago and then I was like by the way do you mind if I make a video about you guys and then she's like yeah that's that's totally fine and she, her shop is really just interesting you know it's been around for like a hundred years and her family's background is kind of tragic but like you know pretty pretty inspiring and then just seeing like the work that they do too, it's just it's so delicate and like like their hands, you know, like like the guy's hands are kind of stubby and like rough, but like they make this really cute like delicate food and um, it's just delicious and really cute and I think it's a it's a part of Japanese culture that is has suffered a bit in the last 50 years because of the introduction of Western sweets and I I guess. That's just a way of life, right? Like, you get more competition. You have to innovate. Um, but, yeah, it's been fantastic to be able to, like, collaborate with them and try to support their business, too, you know. That's awesome. And beautiful wagashi. It looks so delicious. Can't oh, wait so to go good. and yeah. try it. Yeah. It's really, uh, really good. Yeah. So is there any, like topic or cultural point that you really would like to cover that you want to go sometime next year and and try to cover or is it more like you just go along with life and then you see things along the way and oh mm. I'll, I'll cover that like how do you choose your topics there's a mixture like some videos like a lot of my shorter videos i just kind of like pick up a camera and i just want to i was like oh this could be fun like like the recent video i did on like macro photography in japan like that's very random and uh yeah on the spot but i want to create um a video on the ainu <clears throat> so recently i got in touch with a journalist uh, her name is mara bajan who did this uh who was interviewed for this podcast the japan times about ainu representation and ainu um you know culture and so now i want to contact other people who uh, specialize in ainu studies and obviously identify as Ainu and um, I want to create a video like a, a bit longer video about um, how you're going to maintain these traditions and Jap uh, Ainu culture in modern Japan because you know growing up in Vermont like we used to go hunting uh, I'm a terrible hunter but like we used to go hunting we used to go fishing and I mean, I see no need for hunting or fishing now, like, personally, but that's just me. But at the same time, like, I do remember that connection with nature, with my grandparents or my dad, my uncles, my... And I think that was really important because, you know, when you have to, like, hunt something and, like, you know, dress it and eat it or cook it and everything... You get this respect because you're like, oh, my God, like, I just killed something, you know, and it is grotesque. It's not, you should not really enjoy it, right? But it is a part of human history and culture. And so I think um, whether it be, like, you know, American Indians or, like, Ainu, like, I think this indigenous um, culture of, like, hunting and gathering and and being in touch with nature is really important. But how do you connect that with modern living? Like, I've recently started, you know, not cooking meat or using that kind of stuff, like, at home, because I can control that at home. Um, 
because I do think it's more sustainable, right, to rely on, you know, vegetable-based stuff. But I think I I wouldn't be able to like tell that to a person of Ainu heritage, I, because I know how important it is to have respect for like the kamui and that kind of stuff. And so I really want to see like, okay, how how do you like maintain this Ainu identity in the next hundred years, where I I imagine there's going to be fewer people eating animal-based stuff. There's going to be less of a connection with nature. There's going to be maybe even more diluted culture potentially because of like urbanization and stuff. So I want to see I want to see and interview these Ainu and and these experts and be like, how do we maintain this culture? Like, how do we maintain the semblance of like identity um, in the years to come? And I want it to be kind of uplifting too. Like, I don't want it to be like this doom and gloom thing. But yeah, I want I just want to know. Absolutely. And what you're doing with documenting the situation and talking mm-hmm. to people about what they want to do and what their hurdles are and what mm-hmm. their successes are, this is the first step in pre- preservation, right? So it's so important. So that sounds like a great project, really exciting. And that's, yeah, hopefully it happens. And that's our hour. Thank you so much. I think we could have continued for another hour. You've got so many interesting projects. So please join us again in six months' time, and we'll see where you are and what projects you're doing. Yeah, thanks so much, Bobby. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joy. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. And uh, Mary has a comment. She says, thank you. What a fantastic interview. Bobby has a wonderful future. She had some great comments (laughs) along the way as well. Um, Thanks, tomorrow, join us again tomorrow, everyone. Um, if you're interested, 6 p.m. talking to Yukari Sweeney, who's a Japanese designer based in London. So we're going to be talking to her tomorrow night. Um, thank you so much, Bobby. Yeah, best of luck with all your projects. I know you're super busy, but there are people like us, like me, like the people watching the show who really appreciate what you're doing. So keep it up. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joy. See you later. See ya. Bye, everybody. Have a good day.